A big thank you to AA and UFC4 for sponsoring today's video. There you go. Yeah. Me and the lads are always playing this in the studio, and as you can imagine, it's a good way to settle some sort of personal grudges that develop when you're working alongside Lawrence McKenna. To celebrate the UFC coming back to London, UFC 4 has dropped a huge update, including some of the best British fighters. This will include Paddy the Baddy, Paul Craig, Tom Aspinall, and of course, today's guest on the podcast, Molly McCann. All for the first time representing the UK in UFC 4. This update is released today, so as you're watching this, you can also be downloading, updating, doing the thing to get in the cage and go, you are right, la? Scousers, we don't get knocked out. You can do all that right now while listening to this podcast, so it's a no-brainer. Get in the game, guys. So log in now to your console and get the UFC 4 UK Fighter Pack and play as all of your faves while listening to this bloody good podcast. You've not heard it yet, but just trust me, it's really good good this one if you haven't got the game don't worry i've got you covered with a discount you can click the link in the description below and get up to 80 percent off to get your copy of the game and then you can have it all it would have worked better without the dishwasher but when this is uh annoying but paddy the bad news it's a limited time offer so get your clicks in the description while you can just say but for now it's molly mccann on the pain game podcast this woman say that what a ledge at one time i was homeless instead of going home every night there was no home to go to life at home was very difficult i grew up being abused I lost my belt. I lost respect. I embarrassed my family. My vision was pretty much non-existent. I was able to just about scrape by the medicals. I come out, I have supreme confidence, but I'm scared to death. I'm afraid of everything. I didn't care about living, I just wanted to die. I got up and I felt the weight of the world was lifted off my shoulders. I knew I was going to make a comeback. Fighting, this was designed for me. This is what makes us who we are. I'm the best! Who the fuck I'm so far ahead of this game. My dream, my vision for myself is to be the greatest martial artist to ever live. I have always been a fighter. There is nothing I do better in this life than fighting. There ain't never been a man that could better me. I was born to do this. Nobody can get close. I'm the best fighter in the world. I'm the most brutal and vicious and most ruthless champion that's ever been. Welcome back to... The Pain Game podcast, today's guest could be described as the baddest woman in Britain, but that sounds a bit like a Netflix documentary, doesn't it? It's a bit, but um, Molly, pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks. I'm really sorry if little Frank barks, lads, get to bed. No, it's all good. It's sorry. all good. It's, uh, we're, we've all, How are we, lads? I'm a dog lover. I'm a dog lover. It's all good. We're, we're excited today because obviously you've just entered the UFC game. I've got my copy. Don't know if you've got uh, if you've got I yours. haven't got it. You see that? Have you made that for me? No, no, UFC did. Seeing that, look at you. What? Yeah. I can't even screenshot this. It's Lad, all right. that? I'll, I'll send you. A, I'll send you a picture. <laughs> I love the fact that I've got a copy before you. <laughs> Is it UFC Four still? Yeah. It, yeah, it's the new one. It's the UFC Four. Yeah. So uh, that's wow. you in the game, the Queen of the Ring or the Cage, rather. That's unreal, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, I've made it onto the front of a the game. There you go. <laughs> You're officially a, a superstar now. That's it. Well, uh, I said to Paddy, there's a few things on my bucket list. Uh -huh. World champ, being in a game, uh -huh. um, being on a mural in Liverpool, and I feel like I'm just slowly starting to tick them off. So I'm, pr I'm pretty days. sure all of those are, are on the cards like at this rate. I can see it. <laughs> uh, this is your year. <laughs> To be honest with you, like this is this is the year of uh, Molly McCann. It's uh, it's been amazing. It's like it kind of reminds me a little bit of Masvidal when he had that year where he turned it all around and all of a sudden it all came together. And obviously mm -hmm. it culminated in your last UFC event where what a knockout! I mean that is knockout of the year. Uh, I hope so. There's been a few close contenders, but mm. I don't think anyone slept their opponents as much as what I did. No, you and the way you lined her up and then span round and you know uh, the arena erupted and you sort of set the table for uh, Paddy and Aspinall like you you took it up a level and then the crowd were like okay 
this is this is it now. This is going to be the best event we've seen in the UK. And um, how does it feel to, to get to that point where you are having that, yes, I am here to stay. This isn't going to be taken away from me, which I feel like yeah. was a bit of a worry early on in your career. Yeah, I feel like when I stepped into the UFC, it was a bit too much too soon. Do you know what I mean? I'd had nine fights, including my amateur fights, and was on the, the biggest stage. And I had to do a lot of growing in the ground, on the floor, in front of everyone. And mm -hmm. sometimes it didn't go so well, but I learned a lot. I learned a lot in those lessons and in those fights. But in September, when me and Paddy both got the 50 grand bonuses, I thought, now I've arrived. And then at UFC London, I felt like the pressure was more on Patrick than anyone else, even more than Tommy, even more than... Pardon me, Arnold Allen. So I thought when I go out, just get the, the crowd going. Like, if you've seen me posts every week, it was just the fans, this is for you. The fans, this is for you. That walk out, I walked out to a Jamie Webster song called This Place, which is all about Liverpool. I literally screamed to the top of my lungs, my people, my city, my heart. I just went in there and I thought, as long as I give what I'm capable of giving, then that's enough. And and what no one knows is, well, just before New Year's Eve, I fell over and I wasn't even drunk. I dislocated my shoulder, I tore my pec and I sprained my sternum, like my Jesus. AC joint. So I couldn't throw a punch for six weeks. So it was only the last four weeks or three weeks before the fight I was actually able to start to punch. So I had the best performance of my life when my body was the worst it could have ever been. And, and after that last fight, even though we, I've kind of blew up again, um, I've been doing so much strength and conditioning and weights. And if you can imagine, I couldn't squat for about six months because I couldn't put nothing on my shoulders. And my little legs are like this now, ready to come <laughs> for uh, Hannah Goldie in July. You can see there's been a bit of a body transformation as well from your first performance in the UFC. You look like an athlete now. Has that been a conscious thing where you've really knuckled down? If you look at me and Pad Paddy, me and Patrick, we're two kids from this city who've got to the head of the game of heart. If you imagine my coach, Paul, we're his first crop of fighters mm -hmm. um, from from the beginning. So as a, as a group and as a collective, we've all leaned on the job. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes I've got it wrong, sometimes they've got it wrong, sometimes Paddy's got it wrong. But we've all levelled up in terms of like professionalism and... Um, out of camp, I love a bevy and Paddy loves his scran, but like when we're in camp, we're like brothers monks and and even out of camp, we still train every day. Do you know what I mean? But mm -hmm. nutrition, weight making, I fuel my body for performance, not to make weight, if that makes sense. So whereas before, I would just be like, oh, I'm on a weight cut from the day I started camp. Now my cut doesn't start till two weeks before the fight, so I can have eight to ten weeks eating responsibly and periodise my food. Like me, um, mine and Paddy's nutritionist. We're all in this like little group on our whoop band, so he's looked every day he's watching and he's like, you haven't had enough macros today, this, that and the other, and constantly like, uh, you're lifting today, so these need to be an explosive day, so have these gels, have these bars and... It's just how much we're willing to fight. We've now got a team who's willing to put that science in. And I think if you can if you can make a fighter an athlete, they're going to go so much further than a fight an athlete who can't be a fighter. Mm -hmm. Do you know, like like you'll have people. I don't know if I should really say because he's achieved so much and has had fight big fights, but. Emir Khan was an ultimate athlete. He was so technical. Yeah. But then his his chin wasn't a fighter. And mm -hmm. I'm I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I'm just trying to like explain what I mean. No, we, we, we've all I mean. we've all seen those kind of fighters, and you're completely right. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you if it's not in you, you can only get to a certain level. Whereas if the fighter's in you, and then you can hone the athletic skills, you can go as far as you want, really. Yeah, yeah, um, because as long as you're willing to push and work harder, then why not? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And with, with you, like, you are generally at a bit of a disadvantage in every fight at that weight class because <laughs> you're smaller. A little bit of a Mike Tyson style when you're in there. You're having to peekaboo and get around these uh, straight shots coming at you. Can't mm -hmm. be easy. Have you ever thought about dropping down a weight? Um, yeah, we put me on the Dexter machine. We've seen um, what I can make and what I can make safely. Now, here's, here's the flip side of the coin. 
I can knock people out who are five foot eight and I've got a nine inch reach advantage off me. I just wasn't applying correctly and I hadn't I hadn't smoothed it out. Do you know what I mean? So sometimes this is a good statistic. I've generally only lost to people who've been popped for steroids and saved mm. bands. Wow. So I'm cool with that. <laughs> and um say me lost two losses. One gay has been fucked off now because she's being popped for steroids and the girl before has just fought Shevchenko and arguably pinched the fight, could have got a draw, could have gone mm-hmm. either way. Mm-hmm. So when all you've known is being small, it's not that hard because you kind of have to give yourself a, like a, a, a little man syndrome. Like, well, I've got it and force the fight. And sometimes the fights, the people are that long. I have to just press, 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 press. Whereas... This fight is the first fight of my whole life where I've got one inch reach on the opponent. So Jesus. you're just going to see a totally different fight. <laughs> it's going to be very different. I know, yeah. But in regards to you dropping down a weight, and obviously it's your career, you know yourself best, but you know we remember the way McGregor was at featherweight compared to what he is at other weights. And you think with your power, if you did drop I'd, down... So I'd have to drop too much muscle. Really? So that's mm. the... Yeah, sorry, I, I've got digressed a little bit there mm-hmm. yeah it would be i'd have to run the legs off myself and mm. um, the girls are still taller than me at that weight everyone's still five 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 six mm. but like post mma i would like to finish in boxing i started amateur boxing i'd like to finish there with a few fights but i'd probably drop to 120 i fight at 125 the five pound difference isn't too much yeah. because i'm i've got myself down to just the water load that uh-huh. gets three four pounds off me the last three days and then i've made weight whereas if i'd done that in boxing i just have to have a bath or two to get the other five pounds off so i'd probably do that but 10 pounds a big ask do you know what i mean especially when you're already cutting a lot obviously and running and doing all your training it's not like you can just do more cardio you're already tired so you mentioned boxing there that's fascinating because i see you on the zone you obviously know what you're talking about. You like me. You're passionate about all fighting. Yeah, we're seeing some big fights being made from MMA fighters stepping in there with boxers and all sorts. So, is there anyone out there in boxing who you think you know what? I'd like it. I'd like a, a fight with you. I reckon I could have you. Yeah, there's a few. I watch my weekends, lads. Like Friday, I come home. There's never any sport on, but Saturdays, like watch the football or go the football. Mm-hmm. Come home, watch the boxing. And then either if I'm out in town, come home and then the UFC's ho- mm-hmm. UFC's on. So my weekend's just sports based. And I don't, I wouldn't like to do like a crossover, like go there and come back. Like by the time I have a go at boxing, it would be because I want a career in boxing. Yeah. Um, it seems I like that's stop- the mistake they make, isn't it? Where they try and yeah, go yeah, away, yeah, yeah, come you back. Can't, you can't play, you can't play boxing. You can't dip your toe. You, yeah. You, it's like you could never do that with MMA either. So uh-huh. people are doing it for the wrong reasons. Mine would be like legacy and from when Meatball was this big, like my dream was to, to it was to go to an Olympics for boxing, but mm-hmm. my weight category wasn't added. So that's why I went to MMA. But um, I always have got it in my mind when Katie Taylor has her last fight. I know this is mad. I want to be on that card. I just would like to share that moment and just, have my debut on that card because it's years down the line like I'm full of vision on MMA mm. um, but you'd be naive not to think about what's after MMA do you know like what, what, what's next for your future yeah what a legend Katie Taylor is and her last fight against Amanda Serrano was poor unbelievable I was I was sat with um, <clears throat> Jake Paul's family I was sat <laughs> I had Cyborg on my left and my Ryan Garcia on my right and I ended up having made with one of their um, with one of the lads, Sky Nicholson. Do you know where the boxer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was like, "Molly, tell them kids to sit down." So, <laughs> so I I've asked one of I've asked the mum. I said, "Excuse me, darling. Please, may you ask your kids to sit down? They can't see." And then the dad's not heard, and he's he, like, "The dad's recording, and he's got who the fuck do you think you're speaking to my kids? Don't you ever touch my kids? I went, what are you going on about?" Oh. I said. I'm not asked, it's them behind me. I said, I'm only asking what they've said. He's fucking gone for me. Now, bear in mind... Who was this? Do you, do you know who this guy was? No, I don't know who his name was. Oh. Um, and I wouldn't even give him the airtime. However, 
it got to a point where I didn't want to disrespect. Like, I'm Molly who loves a bevy and a kickoff, live for it. Uh-huh. But I thought, I've got two kids who were like five and six sat in front of me. The parents are just recording them because it's for their vlog. And then I've got my cousin, I'm watching my cousin in the ring fight. It was round five, so she was getting like filled in a bit. And then I was just thinking, oh, I want to punch this man's head in. And then I couldn't. <laughs> and then three more rounds kept going and he's going, what was he saying? Ah, your cousin's going to get fucked. She's getting beat. Ha ha, ha ha. And all this. Then shout out Barstool Sports. Dave Portnoy is like the man. Yeah. He's just gone, hey, who the fuck are you talking to? And then Cyborg stood up. Then Ryan Garcia stood up. And I was just there and I was going to the lad, please don't ruin this moment. I was like... You're obviously like MVP promotion, so you want Amanda to win. Katie's my family. Don't waste this. Don't ruin this. Don't ruin this. And then at the end, they honestly thought he won, right, Brag? So he's turned the camera around on my <laughs> face waiting for it. And when Katie, when Katie won, I just went, I didn't even... I didn't even do anything. And then after the fight, he just went, I'm really sorry about that. I was just in the moment. And he went... It's mad, doesn't it? It turns us into absolute bastards fighting. Like, when I watch a fight and I watch my... Like, there's there's reactions of me watching fights and I cringe at them. There's actually a reaction of me watching your fight. I'll probably send you it where you get the knockout. And I'm going... And I'm like... Why do I have to behave like this? It turns me into the worst version of me. Yeah, like, well, it might, but you're excited. This man was being a fucking dickhead. Yeah. And he was being aggressive to me. And I thought, yeah. I'll clean, I'll smoke you clean. But then I thought, <laughs> could you imagine Eddie Hain looking at me? I, like, I've caused me to not fuck, of course I have. <laughs> so I just thought, don't do it. I had a tear rolling down me because I, I was like, do you know, oh. like when the Hulk is trying not to change, <laughs> and he's like, Hurr! I was like, I felt everything start stretching off me. I fucking love you, honestly. <laughs> like this guy has no idea how lucky he is. He knows well. who I am now. Oh, he I bet. Like, oh, he's probably like, fuck me. I nearly got chinned by a woman in front of everyone. No, because the fucking um, Jake Paul's like manager or person who runs like MVP with him he was like hi meatball you're the elbow girl and all that like like oh. they all knew who I was so uh-huh. he was just being a fucking dick he was just entitled and sometimes rich do you know when you think of like entitled when you speak about the white privilege of a yep. white American man like mm. mid 40s rich all that mm. I was like oh you haven't fucking you don't know reality you you dickhead and, and it wasn't like you were throwing your weight around anyway you were asking politely weren't you so yeah I just turned around and went to Sky that was your fucking fault you bitch <laughs> and she was laughing at her I wouldn't care because that Sky girl she looks like an angel despite being an unbelievable boxer if she'd yeah. have asked they probably just would have been like okay you know like because her demeanour is but it's... yeah <laughs> But I wasn't even, lad, I was dressed dead gaily, my hair was down, I wasn't swearing, I wasn't like, give me a fucking pint. I didn't have a vape in my mouth, I was just oh, like... Best behaviour, yeah, I like it. But Thank I did, she told, I had told them before, I said, if I start swearing on that in front of the kids, I'm sorry, it's just like... It's the biggest fight of like well, yeah. female combat. You're at a boxing sport. event, though, you know, like that. But you're where you're supposed to be. They're, they're, yeah. The kids should be in bed, like, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. God, you're so easy to talk to, Molly. A credit, honestly, a good interview. <laughs> I've, had two, I've had two coffees. <laughs> where the hell was I going with this? The, the, the fact that this guy confronted you, it made me wonder because obviously men have a demeanor and they speak to women in a certain way sometimes. And obviously, along the years I would assume a man at some point has made that mistake with you of not realising like this woman could could eat me alive here Uh, has that happened and if so what did you do there's a famous there's a famous story this okay I've said it before but um, I was working in Subway I was about 23 it was a night shift and some girl it was like 5 in the morning so I'm like still cutting sandwiches like this trying to stay awake Mm. And some girls like stumbled in, mm-hmm. and then this man's come on, come over to him, put his arm round her, and I was just thinking that's a bit sus, that. So I went, lad, what's your name? He went, who are you, the busiest? I went, no, I said, well, like, he was a foreign man, and his English wasn't too great, and I knew she was like, she sounded well, so forth. What, what's the connection there? Like, how's that happened? So anyway, 
me and him ended up having murder and he he dragged the girl and tried to get the girl out the shop. So me me mate Samir is running to the back. I've run outside to go and get him. And as I've run outside, he's gone to head kick me and I've laid back and just chopped his leg. But as this has happened, sorry, before the fight's kicked off, he's on the phone and rang back up. So like a few cars have bounced into the to this road. It this is Ranley Street, so this is like central Liverpool. Five o'clock in the morning, beards tweeting, you know, when you come out of the nightclubs and you're like, whoa. <laughs> and um, and all these cars have come out and all these lads are in the cars. But where Samira's ran in the back, she's rang the busies. And I've come out, had a straightener with this lad. He's fucked off. The busies have come in, locked the shop, trying to take a statement off this girl. Turns out he had put date rape in her drink in a nightclub and then watched her come to Subway. Then um, he was trying to get here in the car and, and human trafficker. Wow. So basically, I've I've clocked it and caught him. And then he got picked up from the busies. And then he was a legal immigrant and he got deported and sent back to wherever he was from. So don't mess with the meatball. Not all heroes wear capes, eh? Unbelievable. They, they wear subway caps. I'm lo- <laughs> Literally, that should have been everywhere, by the way. Like, Well, I so I remember my bo- it, my coach, not my boxing coach, Ellis Hampson. It was a Saturday morning. And by the time I'd spoke to the busies and done my statements, I wasn't grassing, but I had to give a statement of what happened. He, um, he what's it called? I had texted him and he was like, do you need me to come down? Is everything okay? And I was, I was like, it's just funny that like, that was way, way, way back then still. Do you know what I mean? And um, But because I hadn't even had my first MMA fight, I didn't I didn't even think to say anything about it, to be honest, but it is a funny story. And, and I sent him the video so you could see like the camera that would be like on the safe and the till just just glimpsed outside on the on the glass and you could just see me and this lad like I've got my fucking apron on a little hat like fucking gloves what you make your subway sandwich and slip and throw and come on back and this lad this lad's got in pure Jean-Claude Van Damme like like come at me like I was like whoa he's throwing head kicks and that yeah, if someone's throwing head kicks, he knows something. Like, you know, it wasn't one of those where it's just a random guy. So, that yeah, fair play to you. I watch a lot of crime stuff, and the amount of people who don't intervene when they say something, and that's often how people like this girl become a victim, is because someone who could have said something or intervened. Because we naturally, people just don't want the hassle, but fair play. Like, you've literally... You basically saved her life. Like, how does that make you feel knowing that you had such an impact on someone without even? That's amazing. Well, she's fucking, she was a rude bitch. She was so <laughs> pissed out of her head. I was like, Do you want me to put you in a taxi home, love? And all that. And she was like, No. And just got off and got on, the, got a train back to like Wales or somewhere. I was just thinking, You have no fucking clue. What? Yeah. You have no clue. You was just about to be like, sent off to Romania or somewhere like yeah. you've got no Albania gone do you that know was what it. I mean never seen again I don't think anything into it but it's a funny story When did like, she never get back in touch nothing no because the busiest handled it all I can't believe that like that's but I think she was that embarrassed and freaked out it, look it weighing about me do you know what I mean like she was safe hey. I was fucking tired And just wanted to go to sleep And then had to go to training So All in a day's work For Molly McCann Ladies and gentlemen All in a night shift On <laughs> Subway Run Street Unbelievable So this is just before Your MMA career then So So at this point From the research I've done Obviously you've grown up In Liverpool Were you always feisty Were you always Not scared of a tear up Did you have a natural Aptitude for fighting And martial arts Or um, Since I was very young, like five, six, seven. My uncle just had me on to Bruce League and Jackie Chan and um, Golden Harvest Theatre Productions, I think it was, all that. And it was like, I always have a funny story. When I was like eight, my nanny had given me five pounds for Christmas. And I went, can we go to, I think it was called Borders then, or some bookshop. I don't think it's about anymore, but it's mm-hmm. like Waterstones. Mm-hmm. And I walked in and I got two books. And one was called Scally. And it was a, it's the book about the Evertonian fucking away days. Mm. And the other book was um, Bruce Lee's 
striking philosophy on life and, and his life story. And um, I just remember, like, my nan and my mum, like, what the fuck is up with her? Like, why is she bored? What's going on? But I was always drawn to it, but it was too small. I had a really, like, tough upbringing where I was very shy, very angry. And um, and when I was 11, I think I got... I, I went into school one day and got... Um, got booted by some girls. I went to secondary school down south. So when I went in, I just got fucking battered all the time. And oh. well, for a few weeks and then me, well, it was a year. Yeah. And my mum went, right, you go into karate. So I went to karate and then when I went in back to school, the girl tried to do me and I just jumped on a back, strangled her in, in the playground. Proper like Ray and I could choke without knowing it. And, um, and then she never came and no one ever came again. So I was like, yeah, but I was still a bit of a shitbag and quite quiet. But the more sport that I'd done, the more confidence it gave me to be who I am. And and then I started coaching within sport because when I was 16, 17, because I'd done a few years, um, the boxing gyms would be like, well, teach the kids when they come in. And then that kind of just, I just sport and teaching and coaching. I just like ran alongside each other, even st- till now, mm. like, I'm one of the coaches on the English MMA Association. Mm-hmm. I'm like a coach in that on that Weapons Down Gloves Up initiative with Tony Bellew and uh, David Hughes and Billy Moore. And then we just help the kids in the gym whenever we can as well. I definitely want to talk about that because I have had Billy Moore on my uh, podcast. What a story he has. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, and Tony, I'm good mates with. Uh, love those guys. Um, but going back to your... Um, your inner anger. We see that come out and it's passion. 100%. It's, yeah, and, and and as fans, I think that's why we love you and we've gravitated towards you so much is because you let it all out. And in boxing, there's nothing worse than a press conference or a weigh-in or anything where I'm looking at two fighters saying everything that I can predict beforehand and not being the real them, and you do let that out. But the, the, this fire inside you, this anger, and, and what was sort of honed in you as a kid, where does that, what is the cause of that, do you think? What is the reason? A lot of um, of trauma, mm. a lot of abandonment, a lot of family and loved ones, like me biological dad, everyone just getting off and just being like, well, why aren't I enough? Like, mm. why am I so... F- why haven't I got a stable home? Why haven't I got your traditional family or everyone else has got? Mm-hmm. And um, I think my mum just raised me to just be like, the world's owes you fuck all. Go out and get what you want. Like mm-hmm. She said to me once, You're, I know you'll always be all right because you cut from my cloth. You're made of what I'm made of. Mm-hmm. And I just thought, I was. T- I missed school, like I missed quite a lot of stuff growing up, so my development was a little bit behind. So the way in which I had to make up for it was applying <laughs> myself. So hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. The oldest cliche in the book, but even when you come down to my fights, technically and somatotype-wise, people have got an upper hand on me because of the length, so the shots... And shot selection can be more varied than what mine is. Mm-hmm. But I'm I'm willing to work harder than, than that person. And I remember being a kid, walking to boxing gyms now, walking to this of gyms now, this, this, is no no girls, no girls, no girls. It was traditional, Mark. It was karate, kickboxing and Thai boxing, which welcomed me. And I think it was good that I learned the traditional values of karate and then, like, the spiritual values of, like, Thai boxing. Mm-hmm. Like a Thai taught me to t- like Thai boxing, wow. and and when you learn that, you have a different respect for the sport. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? It's not like let's just have a scrap. It's like there's that you're going into the ring, you're sealing the good energy, and you're kicking the good energy out. You're meditating. You, it's just got so much to do with it. And then by the time I met boxing, I got to throw it all together, and then I think just in the MMA. Always in every fight camp, something happens, something goes wrong, someone dies, someone's diagnosed as the dying, they've had to break up with my girlfriend, like, mm-hmm. or an ex, or some, like, big shit in life happens, or I've lost the fight, or I've lost two fights and then got to come back, and I just think, how do you come back? You just, it's this, this is all it is. So, mm-hmm. I know sometimes people would be the same with you, but I would, they'd be like, oh, is he fucking going again? Like, how animated we are, or how much we care about our stuff. 
but like that's because we've had to work for everything and we're just expressing ourselves. So because people know how much you give to this, they do, you are right. People just get involved and I'm always the underdog. I, I think I'm always the underdog. But it's funny, the last two fights before the fights, it's been like the biggest test to Molly's career, this, 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 10 intrigues, nine intrigues, two fight win streaks, blah, blah, blah. I've gone in, smashed into bits and then it's like, Oh, well, they're only cans. It's just like, well, I'm never going to fucking win, am I? I you, like, you've never seen a finish like that off a woman in, in combat sports, really. Like, yeah. maybe there's like there's like one female in boxing, they call it like the female Mike Tyson. She comes in, sleeps that, that white woman with blonde hair, and she's just like out. Like, they're the only times I've seen people like out, out fit. 15, 20 minutes. I love the fact that you let all that out, though. Like, uh, when you talk about that trauma and, like, me, I've been estranged from my own dad for much of my life, and I get I get what you mean is, like, it just builds and builds and years and years of setbacks and issues, and that's why I, I feel like that's, like, when we see you on that stage and when you see you in the cage, that's your moment to just let it all out. Let it out. Yeah. And I feel yeah, I that. Just- yeah, I just feel like um, without like regurgitating Conor McGregor, when you walk to that cage, the shackles are off. Like, it's the scariest, it's literally giving me goosebumps, the scariest moment of my life is that moment. Uh-huh. But it's the freest I've ever felt. And I'm, many fighters will say because it's how we feel, but you go into like your truest form of like, no one can fuck with you in that moment. Do you know what mm. I mean? Like, I know how hard I train. I know how hard I am on myself. What I what I probably make fight camps fifty million times harder for myself because the same like Justin Gaethje, I feel like I have to take myself to somewhere where someone else can't can't come and touch me. And then when I'm in that cage, the fight's never as hard. And it's like you can go to the last fight I had one shoulder, um, mm. the the time before that in UFC London I had one eye in Las Vegas in September I had a broken knuckle a torn LCL and like me, me career riders on these moments, you know what I mean? And it's just one of them. If you're not willing to give up on your dream, then you're going to go out and you're going to give it and you can, it's just a release after when you're like, mm-hmm. oh, I've just done what I was made to do. All of the bullshit human problems that we have on a day-to-day basis, none of that matters when you're in that cage because you're, you're going to some sort of like, caveman shit like you you know like it's it's this is human to gather this shit isn't it like like primal instinct absolutely on what we were just talking about before about all these setbacks i really hope as a fan if anything happens from here on out you start facing it in a different way because in my head it's like you've proved who you are now to yourself to everyone and if, mm-hmm. if you do lose a fight or whatever, it doesn't need to be that massive crisis that it was before. I think you've now, you're established now, you know? Yeah. Well, I feel like the the level of competition and the level of athletes is like elite level, world class. And there's one, two, three percents that, that make the difference, do you know what I mean? So mm. I can take that on the chin. The, the hardest part of the losses were you knew they was on the juice or they've just come off a suspension and the way in which I've lost the fight is down to strength. Mm. That's the hard part to take. But I feel like there's been a lot of growth, like what you're saying. And in the last loss, I went to to Spain. I just got away and I just trained every day and just trained through the pain, but still learn to enjoy me. Not take it as, as rough mentally, but... I don't know, try saying that to any athlete is it hard way. I mean, I, I'm I'm saying this, but then to be fair, you see some athletes and you go, he, has he taken that hard enough? You know what I mean? Like with Anthony Joshua, there's been times he's lost and I've been like, you should be more bitter. You should be more. So it is a balance and, and no one can really tell a fighter how to take a loss, I guess. Moving on to uh, the weapons down, the weapons uh, down. gloves up thing. Like yeah. obviously Everton uh, in Liverpool football teams, uh, they've they've got so many young kids in this area who and we say it all the time like stabbing shootings all of this thing and and i guess this is what you guys are trying to tackle is to get kids to be a bit more like you guys there was bits going on in the mma community and i just left them to that because these were people who'd been stabbed before uh-huh. like darren's being stabbed darren had to leave liverpool and go to brazil get his head down come back mm. and fight again but 
in the the boxing world, I seen Tony Bellew was doing bits with this, and obviously through the Everton connection, and I met with him. Well, I actually met with Billy Moore first. Yeah, he had a real like, and then I met David Hughes, who's like the he owns the the charity Nexus that runs the initiative. I didn't really have too much to do with it at all, and then there was a stabbing last Christmas with Ava White. I can't Wasn't remember. This girl young from memory. She was eleven or twelve. Bloody hell. There was a moment where I remember being a child, well, a child, 16, 17, and mm. Rhys Jones was killed. Oh, God, yes. I'll never so, forget like, it. You, re- you remember these moments where yeah. these mad things happened. And, and I he was an that, Everton fan, wasn't he? From uh, yeah, yeah, and he got hit from a ricocheted bullet from a, a, a rival gang. Mm. He wasn't in the gang. He was just playing football in the park, and yeah. the gang shot at sort and hit the tree, and then it hit him, and he's bled out and had a heart attack. And... Um, I just couldn't believe that had happened. Like mm-hmm. she'd gone to watch the Christmas lights be lit. And I remember saying to my girlfriend, like, it's just blown me away. Like it's completely, it's done me in. And I just mm-hmm. thought more needs to be done for these kids. Mm-hmm. More needs to be done. And I just messaged David, like I need to be more involved. So we sat down and he was like, okay, I'd like you to be a sponsored athlete. So we put our name on the short, that kind of thing. And I was like, I came in with like my iPad and all loads of notes and that. And I was like, no, no, this is what I want. I was like, I want to be the thread that runs between the kids and use on the board. And I want to use my platform to bring eyes, to bring sponsorship, to bring whatever we can Mm -hmm. and to come and teach the kids. So basically that's what my role kind of is. Um, David calls it like a community liaison officer. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'll help coach the kids I'll come in on days speak to them and it works because I'm from Norris Green I've grew up around all that I've chosen not to go down a path where I've seen my parents be a certain way I've got to the pinnacle of a sport still lose still get up still go again and I think it just shows the kids that you I don't really speak with like a very high um, vocabulary do you know like I still speak just like what the kids would talk like and what people speak like where I'm from. Mm-hmm. And um, I just think that's relatable. And it's, it's just seen, it's been different since I've been. Uh, David Hughes has completely overtook it and he's like running it himself now. And it's a lot more of a personal touch. And um, Jazza Dickens, the little boxer, he's getting involved. Um, and it's just mad to think that we're just a group of Evertonians. And it hasn't worked out to be like, Right, as Everton fans, let's do this, 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 and this. Mm-hmm. But it's turned out to be like the people's club and the people of the people's club are doing stuff for the people. And I think it's amazing because there's a lot of these kids out here, you know, they want to be hard lads, they want to carry what they want to carry and do what they want to do. But once you get in that ring, you realise who you really are. You know what I mean? And you realise you're not that hard and actually you're just a scared little kid worried that you're going to be found out for what you really are which is mm-hmm. a skinny ass little kid who can't fight most of the time. But once they get in there, it puts that into them. Like it, it actually does toughen them up. It does teach them discipline and all the things that they need. And it's a, it's a shame that we don't have more focus on sports in this country, because as we've seen in America with the NFL and the NBA, they get so many of these young men out of poverty and out of these situations and women, obviously. And, and not going down the wrong roads. And I think that there's just such a lack of that in I this feel, community. Yeah, I, f- I feel like there'd be loads of initiatives and charities built like the same. Like I remember I was like to and from London a lot mm. a couple of years ago. And there's the Fight for Peace. There's a massive hub centre in Newham. And that gets kids off the street, helps mm. them with, feeds them, helps them with the school work and is a physical outlet for them to do jiu-jitsu, mm-hmm. MMA, boxing, Thai boxing. And I feel like little bits are, are popping up, but the COVID's took its toll on yeah. on a lot of sponsorship, this, that, and the other. And I think it's just going to take a little bit of time for it to, to come again. But I don't know, the, the premise of Weapons Down is is not just to get, not just to, to tackle like kids, kids and gangs. It, it, it's open to anyone who wants a life for themselves, who's not making the best of the situation. So they just start in a, in a gym, mm-hmm. creating like good bonds with an authoritative figure and a coach, like making better social skills, get more self-esteem, creating a routine. Then they go into the classroom. Then they get the CC card. 
and then they go on site and then they learn and then they have a full-time job at the end of it where some the aftercare sometimes is just like do you know like if you was on the dole like come and get your, your card and then it's up to the kid to go and look for a job when they're not ready for the interview yeah. process and all that whereas this is this is a package put together where you you turn up you show up you get the outcome you get to go and change your life and you build self-esteem as well. There's nothing there's nothing that builds self-esteem about collecting your dole from experience. Like it's uh, it's pretty miserable. You know, whereas yeah. you like you say, there's people to be held accountable to, there's people who care, there's actually someone who you're answering to. So yeah, I think it's fantastic that you guys do this. I wanna go back to the sort of beginning of your UFC career because it couldn't have started very much harder for you. Um you got in there did you miss weight? Am I right in thinking that you might yeah, have done? Yeah, so, so I fought like February 20, 24th, I think mm. it was, 25th. And then like mid-March, I'd gone to a cage warriors in London and Graham just sat me down. He went, you're not getting on UFC Liverpool in May. We'll fight in September. He, he was like, they've just said, you get 20 and 20. Who, whoever was sponsoring cage warriors at the time said, they're going to give you this money. It's like four times what you'd ever get for the UFC. Just do that. I'm like, sound. So just out there living my life, fat, jolly, on the <laughs> ale, all that. And then I get a phone call and then it's like, oh, you're in the UFC. So I was like, oh my God. So I had five, six weeks to lose about 35 pounds. Wow. And I win, I win in any kind of shape. Like I was, well, you see an old Molly, it was just skinny fat, do you know what I mean? <laughs> So on on fight week, I had to cut five kilo the night before. Jesus. So I think I cut ten and a half, ten and a half pounds. I needed to cut eleven, and it was just like and Paul Rim and my coach went, "Let's shave your hair." So I'd, I'd, <laughs> I had an hour left to make weight. Let's shave your hair. I went, "How much am I going to lose in money?" And they said two thousand pounds. I said, "No, I'm not shaving my hair to to pay two grand out of my purse." So I literally sat in the sauna till the time like kept fainting getting picked back up fainting picking back up and um and went in and it was i'm not saying a connor and khabib that the, the level that me and jillian were at but that's the styles that the fight was so if it got to the floor jillian was always winning the fight and if it was stood up i would have won the fight mm-hmm. and it was the best thing and worst thing that ever happened to me but because of that moment it, it what can you do in, in your in your biggest fall and your, your your biggest defeat and your biggest adversity in life? Do you like point the finger and say it was everyone else's fault, mm. or do you look internally and go, what can I do better? So that's what happened there. I took accountability for my own flaws. Me coaching staff took accountability for well, actually maybe we could have done this, maybe maybe this, that, and the other. And I brought. Paul Reed on board as my nutritionist and I brought Carl Evans on board as mm-hmm. me strength and conditioning coach and I think with every fight from then you've seen a, an engine you've seen big double leg dumps, you've seen constant, constant you know what I mean? Mm. And sometimes we'll have to have that massive f- oh fuck moment uh, to, to wake up and change who we are and for you that was obviously um going to sleep in the cage and waking up and obviously thinking fuck but can can you sort of take me back to that moment of you're fighting you you know she's choking you out and then you wake I up just and, remember, and what that was like i remember she was on me back and i knew fuck like she's in here and i just thought just go with it like if there's a chance you didn't tap she- out for those who haven't seen it you haven't tapped you didn't tap no no, I was belly down. She had a short choke. So a rear naked choke, you can, like, attack the hands, but a short choke, there's nothing you can't. Mm. It's just, it's curtains. And it was a proper, heavy, horrible fucking moment. I just remember, like, vision coming in, me sound coming in, and... Um, I remember coming round. I'm not sure if you've seen the documentary BT Sport done of me called me Paul Molly, but you just see me go over to like I'm like I don't know what happened, but it didn't tap. I didn't tap, and they go no, no, and I, I repeated the saying about twelve times. I didn't tap. I didn't tap. I didn't tap. I just pride myself on the fact that I might be a mouth and I might be a lot of things, but I I was willing to. I wouldn't say die in there, but like I was willing to be 
to be put out to show like that's how much I want to win because people have tapped for well, people tap for less. Oh, yeah, yeah, we've seen people tap like as soon as the, anything's near their neck sometimes. Yeah, like like you could say the Conor McGregor one on the jaw, like even like Poirier when he was against Khabib, or he tapped, and I just think it's just because they know that they're not getting out of it. So I understand. I, yeah. I'm not calling them a little bitch or anything. I understand. I was just what I'm trying to say is we. I knew I was inexperienced. I went out on my shield. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Don't think you come to fight weeks. I'm going to fuck it, going to knock it out. And then when it gets tough, give in. And, and that's what I tried to do. And that's what I try and do in every fight, to be honest. Because in every fight, there's a moment of adversity I face. There's there's a turning point in every single fight. Um, in the fight in September, I got knocked with a head clash. And yeah, it, like, it yeah, you me. were dominating early, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and, then, and then, yeah, it, it, that swayed that round, but mm. I was fucking it, and then in the last fight, I feel like it was the last, well, the last round, the moment of adversity was there. Am I tired? Am I just going to settle and, and maybe just get, just, just edge the win, or am I going to step forward and take what's mine? Uh -huh. And then that's what I chose to do. Obviously, at that point, you're, it's do or die, and, and they told you like you you need to pull a win out here because we can't have back to back defeats when you've only just got here. What was it like knowing? Okay, my dream is really hanging in the balance, and how did you respond to that in camp, and then actually on the fight day? And my PTSD, my anxiety was like me and Paddy speak very, very vaguely about like depression and suicidal thoughts. Mm -hmm. But I can't tell you that the, every single day it felt like my dad had died again. So I was just like, I couldn't get this. I just could not fucking shake this feeling. And mm. like the week of the fight, me manager's like, oh, not the week of the fight. It was that whole camp. If Molly gets finished, it's done. After that last fight, Mick Maynard's words to Graham was like, Molly's jujitsu is shite. She fixes it. Or she's gone. Like, if she gets finished by a submission, that's it. She's done. Like, she's just not UFC caliber. So then I just made it my mission to be like, fine, I'll fucking show you that I can submit someone. And then I, I really tried my best. I Like, I had this girl in an arm bar invaded again. And it, it robbed me, it would have robbed me of my glory, I think, with the eye. So I'm glad that the fight carried on and I got to, to show people. I'm at, like, we're talking about these moments of adversity. I've won the first round, the second round's close. But I've edged there, and then we're coming to the last round, and like put your fucking stamp on it now. First thirty seconds pop, orbitals blown, and you know if you lose, that's it, you're done. And it's uh -huh. just like how does it, how does a broken orbital feel? To, like obviously painful, but like what is that like for you, especially getting repeatedly I've punched just, in that? I just felt it was there inside, so it wasn't like my cheek; it was like uh, proper in here. Oh, and so I'll explain it to you. It's this eye. So you'll see uh -huh. this eye is a bit smaller than this one. Okay. okay. So the, the tear duct on the top, I've got a massive scar, but you can't see it. It was split uh -huh. all the way up there. Uh -huh. The bone that broke, my sinus attached to. So when it was fixed the next day, they had to take the sinus off, reattach the sinus. They had to open me up there and sew all inside my eye. And then they had to fix this. Now, if they didn't align the eyelid properly, I'd got stenosis of the eye, and like it wouldn't, it wouldn't fix. Or it just, it's a lot of like fucking aggro. Do you know what I mean? But we talk about like how does it feel? Did you see me running around that cage after it? It's like I fucking wasn't asked. I was like, wow. Honestly, I've not. Like you are tough as nails. Yeah. Like yeah. Like well, it, I it, took some hardens in that cage, lad. Like when I fought yeah. Natalia Santos, the knees to the face, the kicks. Just, I'll still keep coming. Throw yeah. a sledgehammer at me, I'll take it. But I just remember thinking, wow. Then we went to the ho hospital and they'd done a CT and an MRI. And they're like, yeah, you're all right. But you're going to have to come back tomorrow when the swelling's like got to its most and then we can stitch it up. So I've gone mm. sad. So then I've got a bottle of vodka out of my bag. And I'm like on the grey goose, we're all drinking, <laughs> we're all buzzing. And um, and then when we're at the hotel having a bevy, we're waiting to watch like Darren fight on the TV. I'm, I'm there with all my fucking gym, everyone, all my family. And um, we get a phone call. Uh, 
sorry, it's not okay. She's got a, um, what was it? The CT's come back. Sorry, she's got a broken orbital bone. So I'm flying round with like a fucking, I put like a plaster on my eye to stop it. It was just spitting on everyone. Oh. And then um, <laughs> it was like two in the morning, lad. And like the doctor, the UFC doctors come over. We're still drinking. They go, what is she doing? She's got surgery in seven hours. Get her to bed. So my mates have got, got got a pizza and they're like coaxing me to my room because one time I had an ale, that's it. I'm like gone. And then I remember waking up in the morning and they took me to the, um, the hospital and I was just pissed out my head still. Like it was St. Patrick's Day and I was like, yes. And I was just looking at Instagram and I just took over like Insta for a bit. And then I lay there and my mum's walked in and um, the anesthesiologist has come in and gone, um, have you been drinking ale? I went, yeah, I had a few last night. And he was like, how much? I went, like, just a quarter bottle of vodka. And she went, you fucking liar, tell him the truth. I went, like, a litre bottle of vodka. <laughs> so proper scouser, I took my own. I had bottles of vodka and bottles of gin stashed in the couches in the Hilton so that all my mates and that could just fill their own bevy up and then go and get, like, a Coke from the bar. Because, yeah. like, no one's balling, do you know what I mean? That yeah. London's expensive. Yeah, this was early so, days as well, wasn't it? This was early days, yeah. yeah. And um, Paddy'd still do that now. <laughs> Even though he's doing seven-figure deals and that's what he Yeah, he's making bank now and he's still sticking to his roots. I Keeping it. it real, that's like Patrick, isn't it? But yeah, yeah. Um, it was hard for a long time after. Two weeks after that operation, I had a check-up and they went, you're like Wolverine. I went, why? You went, because you're fixed. Like, you're fixed already. I was like, no Whoa. way. Two weeks after, I sent a picture to Graham Boylan of my eye, signed off. Five days later, I flew to Santorini for a wedding. I'm, as I'm, I'm sat there the night before the wedding with all my best friends. I was a bridesmaid. Get a phone call. Um, yeah, you're fighting in eight weeks. I was like, what? It's like me fucking. I'm like, what? And um, I didn't, I didn't get touched to the head for. We done six weeks. No head contact was a fourth. No matter what, a break takes average six six weeks to heal. And then I went into that next fight against Ariane Lipsky. I was like four to one underdog, fucked it everywhere. And <sighs> then the mental side still didn't go anywhere. Do you know what I mean? It was still uh-huh. fucking rough. And then I had UFC Boston and beat that Diane Balblita buzzing then. I had food poisoning before that fight. I think you won like three or four in a row, right? Yeah. And then, and then I went on a two fight skid, but I'll tell you this why. Because there was no crowd. I'm just telling you, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it without the crowd. And then you look at my last two performances with a crowd. It's, it's, it's just... It's night and day, it's isn't what it? I need. It's, yeah, yeah, it's what I need. And um, maybe I'm going to have to learn to not deal with it, like to deal with not having it. But I feel like when you're talking to me about releasing all of that that inner shit and just getting through it, that's the... It's in that moment that I need the fans every one of me fights even on cage warriors that had moments of adversity the second that crowd go they know i fight for them so it just gives me an extra life lad i'm like medipac <laughs> you uh you are a people's champion like that's a that's a word that's thrown around that is you like there's not even in question at this point um you obviously had the two fight losses but then you came back and you put on an unbelievable performance, fight of the night. I remember just being like, wow. Like that was, I think for me personally, that was when I really had that moment and connected with you. And one of the specific memories was when you got the phone call after the fight and you were crying. And it was one of those where as fans, we see like, we're watching your life change, you know, and we're connecting. And because we got to see that, it meant a lot. How was it? Yeah, could right. It could make me cry that moment because life had been tough, man. Mm. And when I was in the cage, and because um, I had like a torn LCL and my knuckle was fucked, and I mm. knew my life like was on that moment. I fucking my best friend was like, "How do you feel?" I was like, "I just want to be <laughs> I was just, I was so relieved. Yeah. And, the casuals can, can fucking always troll me and say what they want, but people who know MMA, you watch that and you just imagine the fucking... Sh- the, that, I lost that fight. I was gone from the UFC. Uh-huh. I won the fight in that in that nature and I was right back in it. 
And imagine having to fight someone with a fucking ten and treat to van to John Yeah. It was just so hard. And I just I was just so fucking buzzing. And when I got that money, I just thought, I'm getting a new fight con and now I'm gonna get a new contract. Of course, yeah. And then I thought in 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 all honesty, you get fifty thousand dollars. America takes thirty percent. You then lose six seven percent in the exchange rate. You then have to give your team ten percent, your management ten percent, and then pay English tax. So you're not getting fifty, but you're still getting a lot, and that's what then allowed my life to change, to then create for the next camp. And then obviously I've come into London. I've won that. I managed to get a six-figure deal with Barstool after. Hey, shout out. And, uh, and now I feel like I've got... I'm com- I'm comfortable where I'm not, like, scared about the next check, but I'm not comfortable in terms of where I am in my career and where I need to be. So there's always, like, a fine balance of not getting carried away. Do you mm. know what I mean? And that last performance, obviously, that was the crowning moment of your career where a, a star was born. You know, I compared it to Masvidal. It really did remind me of that knockout Masvidal had where everyone was like, oh, shit, this guy is the, the real deal. And The and Till one or the um, Askren one? The, the Askren one specifically. I felt like the fight where you got your fight of the night bonus was it made us pay attention more. It, it, it solidified your name. And then the knockout was like, and she's a star. And like, boom, it, it happened that quickly. And um, like for UK MMA, you're basically a trailblazer. You're, you're literally, you're becoming the bisping of female MMA in the UK. Like you're, you're, you're going to be that person that people look at and go, she was the first like to do it in the, and have a longevity there. And actually, yeah, ups and downs, of course, but more ups and, and the ups are amazing, you know? So but like, the highs are highs and the lows are lows. And I know there's there's amateurs coming through in little Chanel Dyer who fights for England and there's mm-hmm. pros coming through in, in Dakota uh, from Manchester top team. And I know I know these two girls will make the UFC one day. And I, mm-hmm. I know they will. And I just want to make sure the bar that I I set is raised higher than it's gonna make them do better than what I've done still. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like my legacy is my legacy and, and no one will ever be able to like to touch that or come near it because no one's had to go through what I've been through. Do you know what I mean? Whereas these other gears who are coming through, it's been a bit easier in some ways and it may have been a bit harder in other ways, but the Well that's natural not, though, isn't it? It's not it's, yeah. you know, it's not your fault it's, it's not theirs. It's, it's the fact is is Michael the time, yeah. Bisping made the road for Darren Till easier. Like it, and you're doing the same for these women because now they see how people react to you, they'll want more. And uh and I guess the Bisping comparison is accurate as well because no one has quite had the love that Bisping got yet. I think Paddy is on his way and Darren had 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 flashes of it, but obviously he's had his setbacks. But but with you, I feel like you're doing a similar thing where people win or lose, you've got them in the palm of your hand. And that's powerful. I feel like if people really know me, they know that I'm a good person and they know what I do for me community, for me city, what I do for anyone who I know, I'll, I'll, I'll try my fucking best because mm. we're here to pay it forward. Do you know what I mean? And I just would never want someone to feel how I've had to feel growing up. And that's the top and bottom of it. Mm-hmm. But, like, you will have other people who are loved for their mouths. Do you know, like, Paddy can sell a stadium out like work because he's that controversial. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, but sometimes, even if I lose, more people come and aid to me, where sometimes you can get people when they lose, it goes quiet. I think Sergio Martinez said that famous thing yeah. when he lost to to Miguel Cotto like when he won his real title he had like 180 missed calls and the next day when he lost to Cotto we had eight and he was all off his mum do you think, know what I mean I think it depends on what you sell yourself as like Conor McGregor sold himself as the greatest thing ever so when he loses it, it's tough to, to to maintain that whereas for Bisping for you it, it's about what you're willing to give to the fans and that that hit that we feel that it really does make a difference and i wondered if you were getting a little bit of that jealousy yet if you were getting a, a bit of that in the city yet i can handle this i can handle people who don't like me because i'm an evertonian i can handle people not being into women and fighting because they're old school and they don't they their values are that not that women should be at home in the kitchen they just don't like women getting hit and 
and I know it's a sport, but I can empathise with the thought process and get it. I have to take on the chin that some people won't like me because I'm gay. Top and bottom of it, because I still go and drink in the same boozers, I still go and I'll get I'll get the bus, I'll get an Uber, like I'm just walking through town every day. Um I'm still me, I'm not flash. I, I like I literally go and sit in all the Irish pubs and just watch the match and I, I aim Do you know what I'd love? I'd love you to have the Tony Bellew Stadium moment. Oh, listen, did you see before Crystal Palace? So did you see when we won? Um, and didn't get relegated. I was on the fucking, I was on the pitch. <laughs> I was there with flares. But before the match, yeah. someone put me on my shoulders and I had flares. I was like this. And everyone was going, meatball, meatball. <laughs> and I, someone recorded it and sent me it and I put it on me instant and I thought, I love this club and they love me. Like, mm. I don't love the board. I don't love the fucking toxic, toxicness of the club. Mm. But I feel like, Andy Gordon said the best the fan like Everton are the fans like like true like we changed that we changed that shit for that club Joe oh, you, you, you were getting relegated if it wasn't for the fans like you, you guys yeah. basically saved that club because they, you were yeah. going down 100%. Yeah, 100% and but it took it took the club and it took the fans to split to come back together mm. do you know what I mean and just create and even at that that last game, we went, what, 2-0 down. At half-time, I'm at the table with David Hughes and I was going, lad, I just started drinking and I was like <laughs> nailing the pints going, fuck, Paddy's going to absolutely rub it in my face tomorrow. Uh. And then when it came, I went, if we win, I'll fucking, I'll shave my head, I'll do a skinhead. <laughs> Listen, when that third goal went in, they was like, get the clippers out! I was like, fuck <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mentioned before about women in fighting and how some people have that old school mentality and i've heard this from you know I bo- old boxing coaches and, and things like that you know like it, it it's around but but it's changing 100 percent. and people like katie and like yourself are, are helping the shift and the fact that the matter is is you've got more fight in you than 99.999 percent of male fighters like that you you're brave you're right. There's no um, doubt in that. Don't know. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just a scouser. That's all. Like mm. people go, what is it? I'm just a scouser. But what's that been like? Not every scouser has like that. Like there's a lot of I've watched scouse fighters who are very defensive and and haven't got that gung ho yeah. bold to the world. So what has it been like for you as a woman in a in a male dominated environment? Ha, what kind of experiences have you had? Where because I'm sure there must have been times where people. There's been a few tough times, but yeah. don't get me wrong. This city shows nothing but love. Do you know when I lost the Jillian? Mm. I literally left and went to Chinatown and I've walked in to a, a Chinese and as I've walked in, everyone's gone <gasps> because obviously everyone had been to the fight and I'd had a few stitches and I was like that and I sat down and this man came and put £100 on my table. He went, you're not buying your own food tonight, Gail. Congratulations for what you've done. And I was just like, what? I was like, I couldn't God. even eat. I was like, just give me a pink gin. I'm, I'm like, I can't even eat anyway. But this, like... I run through this city, I'll ride the bike to the gym and you just hear boop, 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 boop. The, the city behind me and I fucking love this city and I fight, like, it's literally, I say it all the time, but where is it? It's there, mm. my city, my people, my heart. And I don't know, some people are cringing, oh, I fucking look at it, but when one of the proudest things of your your makeup is to be where you're from and to represent Skull's culture to try to represent that's like for the, for the best part do you know what I mean mm. sometimes the worst part I represent <laughs> too but I, I, like, I'm only human and I really try I want to talk to you about your uh, partner in crime Paddy um, that moment of you obviously on the on the cage together celebrating together it was as iconic uh, as, as we've seen in the UFC it really did warm the heart Um what were your first impressions of when you first met Paddy? What was he like? I walked in and I think the first time I spoke to him, I think we just sparred and he just had a skinhead. I've seen that video where he's got a skinhead, he's got braces and he goes, they call me Paddy the body. And That's- he's just chilled like that. That's what he was like, lad. Mm-hmm. He was just like, whatever, yeah. Wow. And as he's grown into his manhood and he's filled out, 
he's really smart. He's really intelligent. And mm-hmm. sometimes I think, oh, are you fucking joking? Why have you said that? <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a, there was a big time when we we'd come in the gym and go, oh, what's he done again? Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And and then there's something a lot on of Twitter time, probably. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Uh, and then there's a lot of times where we sit there and go, what's he done? Uh, like, wow. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of what's he done moments. Yeah. But um, he was just always cool. And me and him are just the total opposite, but not. I'm a red, he's a blue. I'm a girl, he's a boy. He's jiu-jitsu, I'm striking based. But we're so proud of where we're from. We're so proud of what we embody. And when we go in there, we both fight the same way. Yeah, we do when we don't. If you know what I mean, our I styles are different, mm. but our like your, passions. Your bravery is on a par with each other. You both throw yeah. everything out there, and it's kill or be killed. And to us, you're like brother and sister. If I was to say to you, who is the real Paddy? Like, because we see the showman now. Patrick, I call him Patrick. I never call him Paddy. Do I? Yeah. Call, um, he is gentle. He's funny, he's caring. I'd be surprised, like, when we was in San Diego, he's like, Laura, to his fiance, can I have a hug? And she's got fuck off. Oh. <laughs> like, he's just so nice. And then, yeah. and then in the same breath, sometimes he's moody, little miserable bastard if he's weighing heavy and his weight's not come down as fast mm. as it's supposed to. Um, he only needs to be told once and then he can do it, other than keep his chin down. Um, <laughs> he just can't do that. Um, Did you see Teddy yeah. Atlas uh, telling him, like, you need to put your wallet under your chin? Uh, well, there, yeah, he fucking, we used to say, put a 50 pound on there. <laughs> yeah. Lad. Obviously, Paddy, right now, it, it, he is taking off as one of the most talked about fighters in the UFC, in the world, even. Have you felt like there's been changes? Because it's only natural as a young man. No, no. Um, I know what you're going to say. And no. I- he reached stardom at the age of 21, 22. He lost the plot for a good two or three years. Mm. He lost everything and he's built himself back. So it's a good thing he got to learn in front of like 50,000 Instagram followers as opposed to the world now. Okay. Um, he knows what he wants. He's getting married next year. His team, all of us are his family mm-hmm. and we keep it tight knit. And, um, I feel like the more notoriety we've both got, the the tighter the circle becomes. That's a smart way to play it from experience. Uh, yeah, like, yeah, like don't get me wrong, there was a point where we both... I never reached his notoriety the first time round when he did, but I've still noticed like where my life's changed. Say from September to... Last September to like December, just before the last fight camp, like my life changed and I seen who was in my life at the parties and who just would go out with, with me and who was there in the fight camp and who knows if they had a bad influence. So some friends of mine go, we love a bevy and go in the game. So I'll just see you when you're out to come. Like I have good people who know how to do that too. Uh-huh. Do you know what I mean? So we're, we're quite lucky. Um, I've had to do a lot of growing. And especially after that last fight, like, understanding Life has what's changed. real and what's not. Yeah. Yeah. L- I, like, L- you're changing as well for the better. You're trying to become more serious. So yeah. the people who aren't about your positive growth need to go, I guess. Yeah, and I suppose I've made mistakes still. Uh-huh. Thinking something's acceptable and it's not. Or, like, putting me foot in things. Or nah, never really being rude, but, like, I have to open that, open my eyes to see my situation and, it's not actually all just about me all the time because life is so overwhelming with media and with everything. And mm. you can't walk down the street with just people constantly. Like, I was on FaceTime to my godson and my best friend yesterday. A seven minute walk, I must have talked about six pictures. Do you know what I mean? And I was just like, I'm literally headphones and sunglasses on and just walking down. Little, like, <laughs> it's like, you don't, you're now public property. So that's what I've had to get my head around. And it's hard given the wheels everything and then coming home and not giving me partner something or giving me mum something or me friends but the closest people know this has just got a shelf life and once it's done I can be Molly and I don't have to be meatball again do you know what I mean very much so do you this fame thing it's a weird one because 
it, it can be draining, as you've just rightly explained, but then it, it can also be fun. And, and, and it's it's about like not letting it it's, control you almost. You have to control it, I guess. So that's that's what I've I've come to terms with. Yeah. And like not dancing with the devil. Um <sighs> and having people around you to keep you honest. Mm. Like my girlfriend has absolutely kept me in check and ripped me a new asshole <laughs> like recently <laughs> because because of my behaviour. Oh really? Um, what what kind yeah. of behaviour do you think that needed checking? I'm done in all the time. All the fucking time I haven't got the energy. And it's just like, well, your life's gonna be like that, so you can't just keep being rude or short or just disrespectful. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's not her fault, so why am I taking it out? You take it out on your closest person to you. Of course. Do you know what I mean? And, yeah. and, and I have to grow and I have to learn and understand and compromise. And she pushes me to be the best me that I could be. I couldn't have done that last fight without her. Wow. And it's just it's just the last fight camp without her, sorry, just because of my injury and mm. just she just helped me through. So it's just getting that, making sure everything's okay and not just like, Say I've got loads of fires, I've got to keep them all stoked the same and not just like putting on yeah, the gas. And, and prioritizing what's important as well. And try, I guess, trying to calm, uh, calm yourself down when you are run down and realize actually, why am I run down and whose fault is that and why is that? Yeah, yeah. I've got ADHD, so my I'm like this. Like, I can tell you. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> and sometimes, lads, like it's, it's, I've had so much personal growth recently on understanding uh-huh. myself because of it. Do you know what I mean? She's like, well, yeah. look at this, 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 and this. Maybe you need to address this. And I was like, so that's why I can't process that. And that's why this is overwhelming for me. And it's just a fucking never-ending cycle of growth, this this thing called life, isn't it? How long, have, do you mind me asking, how long have you been with your girlfriend? Um, about nine months, eight months, eight, nine months. It sounds like she's made a very big impact on you in that time. She's very wise. <laughs> she's the total opposite opposite of me. She's is, she, is she from the by, area or did you meet her? She's from Sheffield. I went to an Everton game and I sat in a seat and she was just sat next to me. She, no works, way. With the club. she works with the club, yeah. Wow. I, obviously, I, I read up on you and, re- and I did a bit of like understanding what it's like for someone coming out as I'm I'm reading about your life and it, it, it's not something I've had to do so obviously this is sort of I'm, I'm finding it quite fascinating that the pressure that you described uh, yeah. that you kind all the fears that someone would go through um can you sort of explain a bit about how you came to that point of I'm ready now versus the original feelings of, oh, God. It's you're never ready. It's like probably finding out you're pregnant, I imagine, when you're not expecting it, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, no one, no one I don't think is truly ready yeah. um, just because of the language and the vocabulary and the, the attitude towards gay people and that it's just, it's always been fucking hard, lad. So uh-huh. it was only being in, in and around the gym that made me feel safe. Really? And that's, that's all it is, like... I've done enough. There's enough on that. Do you know what I mean? There's like, it's obviously Gay Pride Month and all of that. And there's literally like a, um, I was like a guest editor, editor in the Metro today about me coming out story. And, uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, there's loads where family, friends, just people are educating themselves more on how they can make people feel. And I just think me coming out my friends and family um, were mortified that they ever felt I couldn't because of maybe how they had been. So when people take accountability, and I'm not saying they were homophobic, do you know what I mean? But just like, just little words or jokes, like in the mm. 90s, people could get away with being homophobic and racist in jokes because yeah. they wasn't getting called on it. And then people woke and got got fresh to that, do you know what I mean? But, lad, it doesn't even matter about being gay. Like, you'd get one for being a Geordie, being working class, being a Scouser. Everyone has their thing that they've got to overcome in their life, do you know what I mean? And mm. Kelly Holmes is literally doing it now, isn't she? She's she's riding that big, big wave. And it's all three, like, everyone knew. Uh-huh. But for us, and then people are shocked why we have this whole, oh, I'm really scared to come out. Well, 
the fucking world has made us that way. So of course, it's all of your actions. <laughs> Do you know yeah, what I mean? yeah, exactly. And I seen that you wrote a children's book on uh, that thing. So uh, credit to you. I think it's great that you are trying to sort of um, tell your story to kids in a, in, a, in a way they can digest it as well. Thanks, lad. Appreciate it, man. And also, but just just while we're on that topic of your love life, I just wondered getting a little bit famous, right? In that, in that, what did that? make things interesting for you before you found your partner were you like wow i'm getting attention from this girl and that girl and so i've oh. never been like openly gay and single i don't really think but mm. what i did realize is like i'm not someone i'm not like a womanizer them objectify women like I, like that's not that's not me and i uh-huh. still really shy about my relationship and putting it on social media and things still like really fucking freaks me out to be honest but <laughs> why does it uh, freak you out just because everyone's got fucking something to say, do you know? Uh, and I'm not bothered, but like when you're still coming to terms with like your shit, uh-huh. every time you have to talk about your coming out story, you you're going through the process again. Right. So if you've ever had a breakup or uh-huh. um or a me- member of your family's passed away and uh-huh. you speak about it, sometimes it like it comes, but like unfortunately, like I chose to try and change people's lives by or help people by talking about my story so that's my shit i have to deal with yeah, you know yeah. What I, mean? I feel you on that i've talked about certain traumatic things that have happened to me before and it's sort of there's a point where you go right i know i'm doing good by saying this but unfortunately i'm becoming that guy who then whenever i'm in an interview this traumatic shit is going to be brought up and i'm like oh. so yeah I, i'm sorry for like if i've pride or anything oh, but no, not no at all. i appreciate you sharing and uh and i and i get especially why if in a in a relationship that's a nine month uh old relationship why you'd also be protecting your your other half as well in not pu- pushing it Listen, like she that. comes to all the fight shows and yeah. like anywhere i go she's there she came to america with me and mm. came and done all the bar steel stuff and that like I don't know. It's just the, the less people know about the business, the easier your business is. <laughs> yes. Um, one, uh, one last question on, on the Paddy thing as well. Uh, we had Logan Paul on my podcast in the last week and he called out Paddy and said that uh, he wants to fight. <laughs> and, uh, in, it, you know, it, it's an interesting one because obviously like I've, I've met them both and Paddy's actually a really big lightweight. Like actually when you meet him, you're like, wow, you make lightweight. Um, and uh, I, I wondered if you thought that that would be a fight worth making. It's not even worth a conversation because it's mm. not happening. It will never happen, will mm. it? Dana's never going to let him sign in the UFC. This is never going to let It's like when people talk about fucking... Connor fighting Paddy one day. It's like it's not going to happen. So yeah, yeah, I get you. I get you. Bit of fun. Bit of fun. Nothing more. Speaking of which, um, before I end, I do want to talk to you a little bit more about the fact that I've, you're in the game. <laughs> Man, just that Liverpool on the back. That's the city skyline. Yeah, how cool is that, right? Dick, hang on. Can I do a screenshot on this? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hang on, guys. I'll send you a really good picture of it. I promise. Okay. And also, uh, we've got another one with you, uh, Paddy, and uh, Tom. So all the boys are from uh, UFC London and that big and event. And Big Craig on it. Yeah. So yeah, I'm sure they'll be sending your copy to you as we speak. If I've got one, you're getting one without doubt. Hey, can we now listen? Can you show me what it look like or what? Uh, well, I will, I'll sort you out after, I promise. I'll, I'll get them to send everything over to you. Uh, but I'm buzzing to see. Fast? Have I got blonde hair or brown hair? Uh, let's have a look, yeah. It looks like it's your most recent hair. Yeah, on your last one. Because I've had, like, let's not joke, I've had a glow up recently. <laughs> I've, had bo- I've had Botox, I've got blonde hair. My teeth are white. I'm You're getting- looking good. You're looking I'm good. Getting composite, I'm getting composite bonds tomorrow. Honestly. So, yeah, the globe, is in, the globe package is included for Molly McCann in the new UFC game. She's looking her best. We can't wait to uh, play as her. And, um, I mean, what, what, you, what is it going to be? Time. Can I literally... T- I've got the PlayStation game now. Yeah, yeah, Can you, I play my mouth? Yeah, they, I, I'm pretty confident this is all ready to roll now. So, yeah. Um... What, how are you going to feel? Like, that's as, that's, I've made it as, like... I literally texted me 
gay friends today saying, don't do anything, don't message me anything that's going to spin me head out or do me head and stay. And she's gone, what? And I went, it's one of the biggest days of my life. And oh. she put, oh, of course it was to do with me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, I'm going, I'm going, like, I've like got to go because I was supposed to leave, like, a little yeah. bit ago, but... Yeah, I can't fucking wait. I, I wonder what colour shorts I've got. Fucking yeah, man, you're going to be fighting for the title in there. You're going to be I'm doing gonna it be all. I'm going to be practising in a fucking minute. Yeah. Um, well, I'm buzzing for you. And if there's anyone who deserves it in the UFC, it's you. So well done. I just want to say thank you. You know, you fight for us. You, you, you absolutely give everything in the cage. And... Uh, yeah, you can go and play on, uh, on your PlayStation or Xbox Listen, now. I'm, I'm actually going to a spa to have a massage and chill out before. Okay. Get everything like, done. Do Get yourself fed and watered. Sit yourself down, switch the phone off. Lad, can you send me in this Zoom chat these pictures? I'll send you everything. Promise me. <laughs> I promise you. I promise. <laughs> Okay, that was Molly McCann on the Pain Game podcast. Um, one of my favourite fighter interviews, easily. Such a, a people's champion. We love her. And um, I can't wait to do this again. Hopefully, uh, we'll get you uh, round with Paddy one day and we can do a, a reaction to the UFC or something like that. That'd be hundred percent. Okay. That, honestly, thanks again, Molly. Take care and I'll see you soon. No problem, lads. I want to see these pictures whilst I'm on this fucking call. Okay.